Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this week's episode of the Sensei Playbook Podcast, marketing strategy for the dealer world so that you can do less and hopefully hopefully accomplish a whole lot more. You know, when you have confusion in the marketplace and a confused mind always says no, today's guest, George Nenny, has made it his mission, his life's work to remove confusion, and he does so, so well with all of his training and reporting tools for dealerships. You're going to want to tune in for the next 35 or 40 minutes. You're going to be smarter. Welcome to the Sensei Playbook, the ultimate how-to podcast for growing and amplifying your brand within the digital world's three-second landscape. Join Bill Courtright and Chris Snellgrove as they discuss the right tools and strategies for building the best online marketing strategy for your business. Tune in to leading business leaders who share information and impart inspiration on providing smooth customer experience and successfully scaling your venture. This is your chance to achieve rapid growth in the highly competitive online market. Let's get this episode started with your hosts, Bill and Chris. Hey, George, welcome to the podcast. We're so happy to have you here, as you've heard, and uh, we've had a chance to talk a little bit offline, and both Chris and I are extremely excited because it is our belief that what we have here is one of the most intelligent and in-the-know digital professionals specializing in the car business that I've ever been around. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a conversation here with Mr. George Nenny. Uh, George, uh, we kind of start our episodes the same way. Uh, it's been said that uh, business today is not about the products we sell, but rather the stories we tell. George, what's your story? My story, yeah, youngest of uh, seven kids, um, got in the car business in, in 93 when uh, two of my older brothers uh, started a business called Dealer Specialties um, back in 89. Um, joined in 93, we really covered the country with Dealer Specialty franchisees. Uh, they sold the business to Trader Publishing uh, in January of 2000. That was the partnership between Cox and Landmark. You probably remember the, the magazine business, the, the publication business. And so um, they retired. You know, after they sold the business, I stayed on. Uh, Trader began making a number of acquisitions in CRM, DMS, websites. I was fortunate enough to run dealer specialties and the operations uh, for, for uh, digital and for websites uh, until August of 2017 when I left to start uh, Generations Digital. And so we uh, we don't provide really any services. We're not an agency. We don't resell agency services or really represent anything. We're in the education and reporting business. So we our, our mission is really to make dealers smarter and better consumers in digital marketing through transparency, through education, and really just trying to turn it all into a math exercise. Best we can, um, you know, our, our Looker Studio decks are uh, are consumed by some of the top top uh, dealer groups in the country to help them not be so reliant on agency reports and instead kind of take control of that reporting themselves and, and really just be a smarter buyer. You know, digital marketing, we, we say this all the time, digital marketing is not difficult. It's just a bunch of new acronyms and, and code words for things that are actually pretty simple concepts that most GMs and dealer owners can, can understand. And, and I think from an agency perspective, you get fired way less if you educate the dealer and make them really understand your reporting so they know what's going on, they know the hard questions to ask. Um, versus just flipping to a new provider because they they saw a great presentation that sounds more like what they would like. Mm -hmm. so, oh, that's that's a long that's a long my story, but yes, that's, no, that's no, it. I love it, I love it. Go ahead, Chris. Well, we have some common ground, George. I actually worked for Trader Publishing for eight years, so uh, oh, nice. Yeah, ninety four to two thousand two. So we we actually crossed paths there. Yeah, those are great years. I I, um, I loved the leadership team there. Just super smart. Um, for, for me, it was, you know, when, when, you know, we joined that company, it was really just almost going to business school, you know, getting my MBA, uh, from, from all the smart folks who had really built that business, you know, uh, across the country, you know, over the years. So I love those years. Yeah. It was an interesting model. I mean, people didn't realize that, that that's the way people used to shop for cars until the internet came along it was those little cheap magazines that were, uh, at the front of grocery stores and sold at the convenience stores. Yeah, yeah. I think I think in some pockets it's still it's still a business. It's still a thriving yeah. business. Yeah. Well, we we rode it into the ground until 2014 because when I left Trader, we started our own, and um, with a few competing titles in different markets. So it was a good run. Yeah. All right. Good for you. So you really know that business well if you did it if you did it on your yeah. own. So yeah. yeah. Moved into digital, and um, it's been um, what was fascinating about the digital um, 
was the fact that um, we could sell to the entire, you know, uh, the, the entire country. Like when, with the pub publications, we had those limitations uh, that were set by the distribution. And so when um, my aha moment was probably in 2014, uh, when we had a little dealer in Loganville, Georgia, selling, he was he told me he wanted to sell Corvettes to in market buyers in California, and we were, you know, or getting pre orders from the, uh, the factory and drop shipping them to the, the dealers out there. And um, if you remember in 2014, the dealers were not discounting those uh, C7s. Um, and, and, okay, yeah. and this guy, this guy in Loganville, Georgia, was offering a $3,000 discount and having the dealers in California, um, you know, deliver them for what, $300? <laughs> so, wow. yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah uh, they, they put a stop to that pretty quick because, uh, but that was my aha moment in digital marketing. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. We can target in market buyers. At that time, we could directly off Facebook. We didn't have to go through the third party providers, but that was cool. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, figuring things out like that digitally or just trying to figure out how to, how to rank in a certain market or conquest another market. You know, there's just all those data points out there. And it's, it's, it's fun to assemble those and try to, Say you know how, how can I how can I win here or how can I win with this product? Yeah, and what's what's really interesting in the in the digital world is is how fast everything changes. It's a constantly moving target. So um, you know, for for people like you, I'm sure uh, you're a valuable resource because um, you have to stay up to date on it. <laughs> and um, I mean that's super important, right? Yeah, you really do. It's it's uh, you know you got to you know whether it's SEO or analytics. You know, I'm on a number of different kind of uh, email lists and alert lists, and you know, consume consume a lot of uh, LinkedIn and other social media just to just to stay up on it. And I think you have to just be curious. You have to you have to you know, hear something or see something that looks out of place, and just wanting to dive into it because you really want to seek to understand. And so sometimes it ends up being an obsession. Yeah, but I'm a I'm a I'm a, um, a very uh, active learner. And so you've so. published three books now targeting uh, education on the, the specific space to the automotive world. Uh, GA4, um, A Dealer's Guide to GA4, um, A Dealer's Guide to the Google Business Profile, and yep. then the Digital Marketing, which is I'm in the middle of. So great yep, stuff. Yep, correct. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. It's, um, you know, it's, you know, I, I kind of stumbled into uh, writing a book. The first book was the Google Business Profile when back when it was called Google My Business. And you, we had assembled a number of different articles and kind of, you know, how-to sheets and PDFs. And I remember it was, um, I think it was Christmas 2019. Um, some of the dealers were saying, hey, can you take all those Google Business Profile articles and kind of put them into a binder or kind of organize them so I can kind of have them all together? And I thought, okay. So we started laying them all out and putting them together. And I thought like, this is almost enough to be a book. And so knowing very little about how to do it, you know, I uh, went through the Amazon KDP uh, platform I tell you, it's it's really not that hard at all. I mean, if you can compose, you know, a body of information you can find on Upwork or Fiverr, you can find resources that can help you format that PDF so that it paginates correctly. You know, you can find plenty of cover designers. And so, you know, I joke, I mean, ultimately, if you want to publish a book, all you need is two PDFs, you know, one for the cover and one for the insides. And, <laughs> of course, to write the inside. But, you know, self-publishing is is uh, is easy. And for anybody who's watching this podcast who's, you know, thought about it and said, like, oh, my gosh, I can never imagine writing a book. You know, dive into it and really pursue it because it's, um, you know, it's never been as easy as it is now. And, and, and there's no there's no single act you can do that, in my opinion, requires like, you know, moderate effort. It's not it's not like it's super easy, but you know, moderate effort that has huge value. So when you hand a book to a customer, to a dealer, to a colleague, you know, it has a, still has a really, really big impact when, in fact, you know, it's, it's, it's reachable for most folks. What I appreciate about yours, George, is the how up to date it is. Uh, because you know, oftentimes I've read, you know, I bought a, purchased a book, and examples are three or four years old. And in the digital space, that's a lifetime, right? Uh, it's yeah. not relevant. So the fact that you're revise, how often do you revise your books? Really, as often as kind of needed. I mean, with GA four, it's now been probably every every four to five months. Sometimes, wow. like I, I did a massive update in September. When you do too much of an update, Amazon forces you to have it be a separate edition. So that was now the first, you know, additional edition. So the second edition came out in September. Google then redid all the admin menus, and so I had to you know, redo that entire section, all those sections. So relaunched it, and uh, you know, quietly, I didn't really broadcast that, but in December, relaunched the book with all updated admin, and so. 
uh, and did a few tweaks after that. If you take any of my books and open the very back last page, it will tell you the print date. And so that's the best way to see, you know, the, 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 the oldest one I say is Google business profile, which is about a year old. And that was, that was a big update because they changed a lot of menus. But since then, there really haven't been a tremendous amount of updates. So that one, uh, you know, maybe, maybe due for a, for an update soon. So that's a good segue. Let, let's talk about the importance of the, the Google business profile, because, you know, I've, I've heard you speak about how important it is for a dealer to have separate assets for the parts department, the service department, even collision. And some dealers really haven't tuned into that process yet. Right. Yep. Correct. Yeah. So, so, I mean, you know, and I, it's funny, I had a, um, I had a, a demo call this morning of our reporting with a dealer. And that was one of the first questions was, you know, do I really need to have separate Google business profiles? And I did a workshop um, last year at, uh, at NADA on this topic. Um, and I really, I want, I wanted to, I wanted my slide deck to really get this question off the table right in the beginning and really convince them. And I felt like I did a, a good job of it. The, the best way for folks to, to make this decision themselves is to grab their smartphones. And, and if you're in the U S I, you know, this should work anywhere. Look for bakery near me or search for deli near me. And you'll probably find like local delis and local bakeries that have been around for you know decades and are wonderful providers, but you're also gonna find Walmart and Kroger and Albertsons. And you're gonna find, you know, all the major retailers, if you're on the, if you're on the um, hardware side, Lowe's, Home Depot as well, they all have a dozen Google business profiles because if you're a Kroger or a Walmart, you know, you're never gonna be able to rank for optician near me or pharmacy near me or deli near me if your primary category is grocery, you know? And so those, they're in different profit centers, you know? And, the, and even though the consumer may think, well, groceries are kind of related to deli and meat and it's just not the way that, you know, the, the internet's structured as far as like uh, citations and directories. And so in order to be able to compete, they have to be able to have a dozen Google business profiles for each of those big boxes. And dealers should think of it the same way, right? I mean, service and sales are, are far different in terms of the categories you choose in those Google business profiles. So if you're a service department, your number one category should be auto repair. If it's the sales side, your number one category might be Ford dealer or used car dealer. And, you know, if, if, if you're, a, if, if you're, if you say, Hey, look, George is crazy. You know, I listen to a guy who seems way smarter and he said, just do one profile. Perfect. Let's take that strategy. Your primary category, let's say it's car dealer or Ford dealer. If you go up against a body shop and their primary category is body shop, you will never rank. You will never show up. And there's plenty of data around that. Or you can you can search for it yourself. Search for collision repair near me. See if you see any new car franchises pull up. You won't. And you're only going to find either the collision department of a of a dealership, or you'll find you know local collision places. And so, just follow the data. You know, don't guess on things like this. You know, just follow the data and, and, and let that guide your decisions. And, and what is the data when you deploy this? When you add those listings, what data? What what data supports that? Like what what do you, what is the dealer saying? Yeah. I love that question. It's, 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 a, it's a great one. I should have included this. So if you go into your Google Business Profile admin, and you can do this as you're watching, the, watching this uh, podcast or, or, or broadcast, and go into the Insights uh, button. Just click on the Insights button, which, you know, when you, when you look at your admin and Google Business Profile, it's in the normal search results pages. That's the update they did. And there's an there's a icon for Insights. That's the reporting engine for Google Business Profile. So when you click on that, scroll down a little bit, and on the right-hand side, you're going to see Search Query. And the search queries are, this is kind of like Google Search Console except for Google Business Profiles. It, it gives you a, a rare kind of insight into, the, into what the human being searched to make your Google Business Profile appear. And when I say rare, Google is really stingy around organic search queries. They don't show those very often. You know, 15 years ago they did. And so Google Search Console is one place to look. But in the Insights tab of Google Business Profile, your sales listing should look like Ford Dealer Near Me, Ford Dealer Cincinnati, or my brand, you know, Nenny Ford, whatever it is. And then my service GBP should say like tire repair near me, oil change near me. I mean, you may get some confusion. And then and then my 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 collision center should say, you know, body shop near me, all those, all those sort of things. And that is really your report card where Google is saying, here's what we think your 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 department profile sells. Here's what we think you offer. And so if your service Google business profile says like Ford dealer, Ford dealer near me, Ford dealer Dayton, Ohio. You haven't done a good job, right? You either you either don't have the right categories, or it's just that, it, that the the listing is in its infancy, meaning it has less than twenty reviews, it has less than twenty owner photos. Um, those are both high ranking signals for a Google business profile. So if you have less than twenty of those, Google ghosts 
that listing and it rarely appears anyway. Um, so, so get those 20 reviews, get those 20 owner photos, make sure your categories are correct. And then you'll start, you know, you'll start ranking better. That's awesome. So the, the, the benefit to the dealer after they begin feeding these new at these new um, properties, um, that say the service and the parts is they're going to receive, they're going to get more traffic in terms of they're going to get more parts. traffic, right? Web, they're going to get more traffic. traffic because they've, they've increased their real estate. They've increased their, their search query real estate. You know, so they've got sales kind of queries over here. They've got fixed ops queries and body shop queries. So they've increased that real estate. We have dealers that sell rental cars. They have a rental car shack in the store. They have a GBP just for rental cars and they rank. I mean, they, they get a ton of traffic and a ton of conversions for rental cars. Same thing with, with pre-owned. A lot of people will, will, will debate this with me, but I've got, you know, working examples. If you have a separate mailing address with a separate mailbox for your used car department, you can have a pre-owned listing as well for GBP. Um, it may get suspended initially. You may have to kind of battle a bit with Google, show them that address, take a picture of the of the building, and then you're off for the races. And those are incredible. I mean, you will definitely get incremental traffic there, all like used cars near me, you know, make model searches. And so um, it's definitely a place to win, you know, for, for, for no money, just, just your time, of course. Well, that, that's, that's, you said it. That's what I like best about this. This doesn't cost a lot, except for some time. Uh, and, and some, you have to have some expertise to deploy it. But um, wow, that's uh, that's interesting. Um, and and are are most dealers taking advantage of this now, or what percentage of dealers would you say are not taking advantage of it? I mean, even of our customers. I mean, our our maybe maybe twenty five to thirty percent of our customers take take advantage of it. Like they just obsess on it. They they yeah. they um, you know they really pay attention. But I would say most do not. I mean, uh, a lot of dealers are paying for SEO. If you're paying for SEO. You know, of course, you should be getting a list every month of what you get for that SEO. Like, what are the deliverables? Did you build landing pages? Did you do, you know, A, B, and C? But half of that work, half or more of the SEO work should be Google Business Profile work. Like, when you get a list from your SEO provider of the work they did, there should be a lot of Google Business Profile. You know, we we adjusted your services. We did a couple posts. We uploaded four or five owner photos. You know, we curated some of your reviews. We flagged some reviews that we thought should be removed. You know, that's just, um, you know, it's just a huge part of SEO. Sometimes SEO companies will say things like, oh, yeah, we don't really mess in that. I mean, we're strictly SEO. That should be your reputation management provider. You know, that's an SEO company that's probably just lost sight of really, you know, what is SEO today? And local SEO is is 100%, you know, GBP. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Let me ask something, George. When you're when you're going sure. in to educate and train and, and provide genuine, authentic transparency to these dealer groups, what kind of questions are you getting from them? Where what are the current fears of multi rooftop dealer groups as it pertains to their digital marketing? I think their biggest fears are um, would you first just finding out what's working and what's not. You know, most dealers are wildly overspending on paid search. They probably underspend on on paid Facebook or misspend on paid Facebook. They spend zero on email marketing, so that's a common thing. Like that's a huge miss. Uh, email marketing is so effective and most dealers have have absolutely zero uh, going on there. Um, I think that their questions are more like, you know, how's it all work? How, you know, they, they, they want to learn more. Um, you know, and, and we, we seek to educate on I me. Mean, w- one of my most satisfying things is to find a dealer who's super smart, well-educated, great operator. You ask them any of their numbers, you know, what their metrics are for their business. They know right where to find them. When you teach them digital, they become um, super powerful and they become more helpful to us. They ask us for reports that don't exist. And, and one of the most satisfying, I get this every once in a while, a dealer will call and say, hey, George, I had a digital marketing um, salesperson come in to sell me something the other day. I asked them two or three questions that I understood. They had no idea. And then they you know, ran off to go get some of those answers. And so that, you know, they, they then overcome that. They're like, you're right. It's not that hard. I know the right questions to ask. I don't know as much as you do maybe, but but I know my way around and I can sit at the table and I can, I can ask for the right reports. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's it. I mean, I think our long-term customers probably ask like, you know, Oh my gosh, what do dealers do who don't have someone like you who, who looks over this because you just see such odd stuff, like links from an OEM website that just break, like the links no longer links all that super valuable new car shopping traffic to the, to the site, or that someone's paying for a Facebook campaign that it didn't, it didn't happen. It's not really launched. Um, 
you know, another dealership's analytics is reporting on your analytics and, and, and double counting all your metrics. And you didn't realize that someone put the wrong code on someone else's side. I mean, all those things, I just, you know, for a lot of, in a lot of cases, I think we help dealers sleep well at night to say, you know, I'm not getting taken advantage of. I'm learning. My staff is learning. You know, we're, we're constantly upping our game. You know, I don't know if that answers the question or not. Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. Chris came up with a, a blog post that did extremely well a little while back uh, regarding the five questions you should be asking your digital agency. Uh, if I pose the same question to you, what would you tell the dealers out there? Hey, these are the questions you need to be asking your agency in the beginning and throughout. Yes, um, that's a that's a good I, I used to have a slide deck and that was like my last my end of my slide deck was five questions asked. So I'll see if I remember some of these. I think the, the one is if, if an agency ever uses these two words, make sure they get defined. If anybody uses these two words and the two words are conversions and engagement. If the agency says, Hey, high five, we had 150 conversions last month. Hold up. What's a conversion. And then you may feel like that's a silly question, but you may find that v, VDPs vehicle detail pages are conversions. And in which case you'd shake your head and say, no, no, those are page views. And those are super interesting. And I know that VDPs can lead to a conversion, but you know, here's my definition. Um, and then engagement as well. Someone says, hey, we, you know, we know we sent you 500 engaged shoppers last month. Oh, good. What, how do you define that? What's the difference between a click and an engaged click? And then shut up and just see, you know, just listen, see what they tell you. And if you get kind of a hollow answer, that person may not even know themselves. If you get a very specific answer, you can sink your teeth into it. So getting those defined, I think um, one of the biggest questions is, um, and, and most dealers know how to use Excel. You don't have to learn Google Analytics, by the way. Just get an Excel spreadsheet and ask the agency for some of these questions. I want a list of all of my keywords for the last 100 days. And I want all those keywords uh, in, 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 a, in a column in Excel. And next to that, col- next to that list, uh, or next to that column, I want a list of all the search queries. So what the, what the consumer searched for that triggered that paid keyword. Then, of course, I want a column for cost per click, number of clicks, and then total cost, which is just those two columns multiplied, conversions, and you know you can do the math like cost per conversion, cost per click, all those things, and just look at those keywords, sort them by the most expensive keyword, and don't pay more than six or eight dollars for a paid keyword. Um, look at the keywords that gave you the most conversions. Look at your branded keywords and see what your cost per click for branded is. You know, if your if your name is a proper name like Nenny Chevrolet, you should be able to get your your keywords for less than ten cents a click. If it's Middletown Chevrolet, that may be more difficult because my name is a geo, but make sure you have good transparency on what you're paying branded cost per click versus non. Um, for all your campaigns, find out your cost per click. For Facebook campaigns, what, what's my average cost per click? Our goal is less than 40 cents. Um, look at your conversion rates from Facebook. When that traffic comes into your website, what's the conversion rate? Our goal is three quarters of one percentage point, so 0.75. A lot of agencies have a hard time even getting to 0.5. So you want to look at that and make sure that you know, it looks like good, uh, good behavior. Those are, those are probably my biggest. I mean, um, paid keywords, if your paid search agency is not diving into specific keywords every month and showing you those keywords, I mean, that's the devil's in the details. That's where your waste will lie. When you compare the keyword to what the consumer was searching for, you're comparing you know, what I'm buying to what their intent was with the search. Everything becomes transparent. You don't have to be George to see it. You'll see it in the search queries. You'll see mismatches. Competitor names, like for instance, if there are actually um, you know, attracting uh, competitor keyword uh, searches, you know that's a bad thing. Some dealers may say, "Whoa, whoa, I want those clicks." But you know, if you inspect those clicks, you know, when you buy competitor keywords, you know they they perform really poorly. And and because Google assigns a quality score to keywords, every month you pay more and more for those because the clicks perform so poorly. Google makes you pay more every month for those for those bad keywords. You know, so so you really want to go through there and be surgical. And be selfish and say, you know, I want the down funnel keywords that are going to, you know, convert um, you know, better than others. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Credibility right there, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, George. That was awesome. Um, you know, Thanks. I don't know where I heard this, but somebody said, uh, you know, it's, it's not what you know that hurts you. It's not even what that what you don't know that creates a problem. It's what you absolutely know that just isn't true. What are the what are the what are the false beliefs or or the suspended disbeliefs that you find uh, dealer groups having today as it relates to their marketing? That's a good question. I mean, I think the GBP one is a common one. That I don't need to have separate profiles. Life is way simpler with with one profile, and I agree, it is way simpler. It's just not the. It's just you're you're losing opportunity if you do that. 
Um, held beliefs. Um, I don't want to name names. I mean, there's a lot of major providers in automotive that just provide a ton of traffic. And it's addictive because it's just tens of thousands of clicks every month that if you inspect them, or, or you know, in a lot of cases are very low quality. So don't get attracted to clicks. I mean, if someone offers you 10,000 clicks, you have no interest in that. But you have a ton of interest in 500 shoppers. And again, that engagement conversation helps you be able to determine the two. I mean, you have to have a good method for being able to separate shoppers from clicks. Um, I mean, maybe maybe the problem, I, mean, I think most people probably check their website on desktop too often. That's probably out of laziness, myself included. You know, most dealer websites are 60 to 70% mobile. And if you're running a Facebook campaign, it's 100% mobile almost. And so you have to be able to, to test drive your site, you know, on mobile first and really just get addicted to always doing it on mobile. You'll find that in a lot of cases, maybe your messaging widget is interfering with your mobility widget and things are getting covered up and, and, and that's real common. So um, I don't know, you may have stumped me on any other like long. No, long no, that was, that was absolutely wonderful. I just, sometimes, you know, Chris and I have certainly heard and, and, um, even held beliefs ourselves uh, in the recent past that local SEO or the Google business profile or certain traditional digital marketing strategies weren't as applicable for, for major car dealers. And I think, uh, I know in reading your books, we've learned that that a lot of our held beliefs uh, need to be reevaluated and we do this for a living. So I think it's it's probably more common than not that there are dealerships out there, general managers, owners maybe, that have held a belief or maybe remember a successful period of time where something worked really well. And then you continue to do that and you go through you know the mid-teens and then through COVID and then today, and it's a completely different game. And I think I, we find ourselves as marketers sometimes re-educating or talking people out of their held beliefs with new information. You know, I don't believe we can change anybody's mind, but I do believe we can offer new information in an effort for them to make a new decision, right? So, right. Uh, and that's really what, what Chris and I loved about, about your uh, your work uh, in, in the, the communications and the speeches you give is it's it's just so much on, you know, regardless of what happened for the last 25 years, what can you learn in the next 30 days to set you up for success going forward? Because the bottom line is you could have a degree 10 years ago. It doesn't matter. <laughs> right. Yep, you're yeah, right. That's awesome. Hey, you did, you did trigger one. Uh, too many calls to action on an SRP. Too many calls to action in general. Like sometimes you'll take on a new customer and when you go on the SRP, the search results page and you're thumbing through cars, I mean, you only see a car like once every two or three scrolls because there's just so much junk and like a ransom note of all these like six calls to action on each car on a, on a, and some of them are digital retail, like apply for financing. I haven't even fallen in love with a car yet. I don't even know what vehicle I want. Why would I apply for financing? And again, don't take George's word for it. Just go in your Google Analytics 4. The wonderful thing about Google Analytics 4 is if you look at your ASC CTA interaction, right? ASC underscore CTA underscore interaction. That's an event that everybody's got firing if you have your ASC goals. Go and look at the go and look at what's firing from that, and you'll see the page. It will show you the page that CTAs happen from. And you know, I'm not going to go into super detail here. It's probably geeking out, but um, conversions happen on on VDPs far more often than SRPs. And and on SRP, maybe click to call, maybe you know, maybe one form if you really want, but but one or two or zero on the SRP, and then you put your conversions on the uh, your calls to actions on the VDP. And again, be selfish. Do heat maps. Do you know? Look in your GA four. Remove buttons that don't get clicked on. You know, when you give people too many choices, like a like a restaurant menu with you know just too many options, you're never ready to order because you just can't get through it all. You know, I can never order a cheesecake factory. <laughs> <laughs> what are the big one. advantages of GA four, like for for car dealers? But yeah, the the biggest the biggest advantage with GA four is. Uh, a combination, a combination of um, the events can carry intelligence. So in GA3, and, and events are nothing more than a trigger, right? If I go to a website and I scroll, that's an event. That actually records a scrolling event behind the scenes to the consumer. If I click on the chat tool and I start to chat with it, I fire two or three events, you know, messaging events through, through uh, GA4. And so those are just triggers, right? They happen when all kinds of things um, occur on the website. The best part about GA4 is that those events can now carry intelligence within those. So within each event, like, like for instance, let's say I'm on the VDP of a vehicle, vehicle detail page. I'm looking at one F-150. 
you know, if I scroll on that or I hit that photo carousel or I do a click to call, all those, all those events fire, but with them, they carry the VIN number, the stock number, the year, make, model, body style, um, the color of the button, the language on the button, all kinds of data is passed through the event uh, through something called parameters. And there's 35 standard automotive parameters that are part of the Automotive Standards Council. So I don't know if you're, you're probably familiar with the ASC, the Automotive Standards Council, which is a wonderful thing for automotive because it creates standardization around all those events. And so, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, CarNow versus Active Engage versus Gubagoo all firing different chat events. They all fire consistent events. They all carry the, the VIN, the stock number, the year, make, model, all through with the events. And if you switch from one to the other, you have no work to do because all those standard parameters, you all just keep flowing through with no intervention. And so it's a huge benefit to dealers. It's a huge benefit to our industry because it's, it's standardized and you know, we don't have every chat provider you know, firing all their different parameters and events, which would be a nightmare to track. And so it's made, it's made our life easier. And um, you know, that for sure is the, is the best part about GA4. That's awesome. And and, cool. and and Brian Pash created the uh, AS, ASC. Yeah, so Brian Pash in the in the spring of 2022, uh, after you know Google kind of announced and said, "Hey, look, July 23, we're turning off GA3. We got to switch to GA4." He had tried this effort many many years before with GA3, but for a lot of reasons, it was only kind of mildly accepted. Um, this time through, he, he founded something called the Automotive Standards Council. He got every major website provider and plug-in tool provider, digital retail provider, trade provider. They all got on board, and they said, yes, we will come up with these standards. They released those standards in November of 22. If you just Google Automotive Standards Council you know, events or something, you can, you can download that PDF. Um, I, I use it all day, every day, because it's basically your pirate's map for being able to decipher what all these events do and the different you know, parameters they carry. Um, but it really provides, I mean, just so much better reporting. Instead of you know, getting a list of all my leads you know, last month for my website, I can now know the leads, the vehicles that were involved. I can break out my leads by cars under 30 days, cars over 120 days old, uh, red cars versus white cars, um, trucks, CPO, gas, EV. I mean, you can slice and dice it by you know, really 35 different parameters. And that's what you're doing for your clients, providing that reporting. Yeah, so we, we, we provide, um, at the very least, we provide Google Analytics for setup for, for a lot of dealers, a lot of large groups. We've been helping them with that implementation, but our business is really around Looker reporting. So we bring that all into Looker Data Studio, which used to be called Google Data Studio. It's a free visualization tool from Google that works really well with, of course, the Google properties. And we flow all that GA4 data into, into Looker, just like we did the GA3 be beforehand. And so it's just more visual, very colorful and you know, so we provide that. We provide a little bit of consulting, but that involves my time. So sometimes that's um, not available. Um, and and uh, but but you know, the reporting is really the fundamental for our business, where we uh, where we help the dealer take control of the reporting and stop relying on on outside reporting. That's awesome. Very nice. Yeah, and it's a ton of fun. I, I love doing what I'm doing. I mean, I, I love the car business and, and have for you know now 30 years. Um, but but you know, most of all, I just I, I really kind of knew in the back of my mind I wanted to finish my career by being very much more involved with dealers as I was you know, early in my career. And so I just love, you know, working with them every day, having aha moments, saving them gobs of money. Of course, you know, I, I hate wasting my money and I hate seeing other people's money wasted even, even worse. You know, it makes you feel bad. Um, you know, when you, when you see someone taking advantage of a store. And so that, that part's very satisfying. What's in the Ford cash? You know, we're coming off a three-year high where the car dealers, like COVID, was a really a gift, right, to the car industry. And you know, yeah. they've 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 had a, a good three years, but now things seem to be tightening up. What do you what do you see over the next twelve to twenty-four months? Yeah, I think it's you know th things you know uh, conversion rates, uh, demand softening. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's happening you know all across you know consumer products uh, as well. You know, time to probably hunker down and, and get back to the basics. You know, a lot of people, um, you know, a, a, a renewed focus on fixed operations, since of course, that's, uh, that's that's always vital to a business. But when when the variable side slows down, you, know, you hear people talking about absorption rates again, which is uh, you know, which is smart and exciting, and, and probably the best operators were doing all those things uh, behind the scenes anyway. Uh, used cars, of course, um, 
you know, I don't think used car supply will probably normalize until you know, maybe late 2025. I mean, you know, we, we, when we have four years of sub 15 million new cars, you know, and of course you can't make a used car. The only way you make a used car is to sell a new one. And so used car supply has been dwindling. The driver pool continues to grow, right? So more people in the driver pool, um, you know, reduce new car production and scrappage of used vehicles, you know, um, is not a published number. It used to be, they stopped, I think NADA used to publish scrappage numbers every year until around 2016, but it was around 16 million then. So let's assume that it's scrappage is 16 or 17 million. That means we probably net lost another million you know, to the supply in those, those four years. And so I just think there's going to be a lot of pressure uh, on that. And I think, you know, I, I don't think um, used car pricing will fall off a cliff. It'll be a gradual you know, reduction. Um, you know, those are, you know, some of my, some of my pieces. I mean, and, and as far as fixed ops, I mean, there's, you know, there, there's, um, well, let's just say this privacy, privacy laws over the last two years or privacy restrictions have been greater than maybe the, the previous 10 years before that. Apple did a couple changes, you know, over the last, you know, 18 to 24 months that really changed digital marketers ability to be able to, to predict, you know, who is this person and what is their intent? You know, spoofing the device ID and spoofing locations on iPhones has made it really difficult third party cookies going away. And so first party data is super important and there's no better use of first party data than email marketing. You know, our, our Canadian customers can't believe that American dealers don't just run email campaigns like month in month out because they can in Canada, you really, you're so restricted. Um, but email is the most trackable of all digital marketing campaigns, right? I know how many I sent. I know the open rate. I know if they clicked, I know if it went in the spam box, once they clicked, I know what's happened on the click. I know where they went, the pages they went to. Did they convert? Did they look at VDPs? Did they go through my photo carousel? Did they come back in the subsequent weeks? I mean, I know everything about those shoppers. And if it's a, if it's a named list for fixed ops, I compare my ROs and now I know I can match out and say, you know, I think that these people that haven't serviced for 24 months that we just hit, you know, we're, um, they came back due to that email campaign. And so, you know, those are good back to basics. You know, focus on your first party data, Continue to obsess on email data collection. Make sure you're doing data hygiene throughout the year on the on that database. You know, send it out to companies like Authenticom and have them you know, do email uh, address appends and dedupe those records and national change of address database. You know, keep that keep that data nice and clean. You know, run retargeting ads. Retargeting is first party data too, right? I mean, you know, most people that leave your site, you know, don't convert. You know, so follow them around on Facebook. Follow them around on efficient networks. You know, using retargeting, but always think in terms of, you know, how do I bring them to my site so I can pixel them and then follow them around during their shopping journey. And let's um, talk about the customer experience for a moment. How important do you think it right now with the current uh, state of, of, of the economy and everything, how important is it for dealers to collect uh, feedback and, and not only collect that feedback, uh, but to, to utilize it? to make sure that their teams are, 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 are delivering the best customer experience possible. Yes. I, I, you know, customer experience, you know, always important. If you're not silent shopping, you know, uh, or silent shopping your, your website and, and seeing what that experience is, you know, you're missing out, especially around chat. Like chat is, 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 is most, mostly disappointing. I think when we go in silent shop or dealer websites, you know, you, 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 you ask if they're open or not, or you, you know, is this car still available? And they, they just shoot forms at you. Um, some of the chat solutions today are moving to just full bot. Like there's no human option. You can't be transferred to an agent, which I think is just ridiculous. Like I wouldn't, you know, have that on my site because it's it's really anti-customer. But I think you gotta you gotta really look at what that experience, uh, what that shopping experience looks like. Um, are you listening to calls? Do you have call recording systems that that can flag you know uh, phone calls to you where? You know, voices got raised or the word no was mentioned too many times or they didn't ask for an appointment, you know, really, really monitor that experience because you can, you know, um, you know, most dealers, you know, haven't bought a car themselves maybe ever, or maybe in a lot of years. And so go through that process yourself. Um, if you're, if you're running Facebook ads and they're causing messenger engagements or chat engagements, look at those messenger engagements. You got to dive into those details and you'll see either confirmation that your trainings work and, and, and that the, that the customer experience is, is positive or you could be disappointed and, and get an area for coaching. Nice. Nice. And do you recommend mystery shopping? Um, that seems to be, um, I mean, are, are dealers doing that as much as they used to? I know that it was, it, 
Yes. I mean, I, I like the idea that I, I just, you hear, you hear less and less about it, or maybe dealers just don't always share those results uh, with us. But yeah, I think that's a, I mean, you, yeah, I mean, all the, all the major consumer product you know, companies are doing that. Um, you, you have to, I think, to be able to, to, to sleep well at night and make sure that things are the way they are. I mean, I've been at 20 group um, meetings and, and one of the best exercises is I'll say, okay, everybody take your phone out, pull up your service page, and I'm going to start my stopwatch here. You got two minutes, successfully book a service appointment on your phone and you've never heard so much screaming and hollering. Oh my God. And, and usually each dealer has about four or five, like I think maybe two out of 20 were successful and the rest of them have like a laundry list of things that were broke. Wow. This didn't work. I got this error. This, I mean, cause they, I mean, multiple break spots. And so, you know, they yeah, just haven't done the exercise. They, they haven't done the exercise. exercise. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, we know, uh, you know, Kyle Disher, he's uh, in the industry. Yeah. He, yeah, he does sure some mystery does. shopping for dealers. And um, I've, I've thought that that's so valuable, like to have someone on the outside, like, you know, um, do that for you and give you that perspective is has got to be very valuable. Yeah, that would be, that would be. You wonder, I mean, it's probably an AI application at some level for being able to do some of it, just paying it, mainly just the, the chat piece and just seeing sure. what that response from this is. I've been pretty pretty vocal about Car Bravo uh, for GM dealers. You know, if you're a GM dealer and, you, and you, you've signed up for Car Bravo, go to your Car Bravo page and try to chat. It's currently, it's a broken solution. Um, there's no way to, um, it, it, it gets in a loop where it says, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll connect you to an EV specialist is the final loop and you just loop in that. So go into any Car Bravo dealer, Go onto a used car and just ask, uh, is this car still available? Um, it's just, a, you know, so th those are disappointing things because they've launched a major initiative and they've not silent shopped it for themselves. And now, you know, thousands of GM dealers have, have Car Bravo live on their site and the chat functionality, wow. uh, at least last I checked, you know, a couple weeks ago is not wow. functional. It hasn't been you know, for months. So those are, those are disappointing for me because we're just selfishly all dealer, you know, so that to me is anti-dealer. And so it, it, it just aggravates, you know, and so we, right. we'd love to, Love to see that fixed. Yep. Cool. Well, George, uh, we always like to end with, do um, you have anything else you want to uh, talk about? Or? No, that's good. No, I, I feel like I uh, rambled a bit, but no, I love, no. love chatting with I it. Mean, and just... uh, great questions. It's almost like we sequenced it out. Your questions were perfect, especially <laughs> on GMB. Great information. Uh, I always like to end with, uh, what do you want to be known for? Like, uh, what do you, what do you want to be known for? I just be just uh, being helpful, maybe generous. I don't know. I mean, we can only uh, be so generous in life, but just, you know, just be a, be a resource or, you know, someone who helps somebody or, or, you know, made things more clear for them or uh, made them better at their job. You know, that's probably most satisfying. That's awesome. Well, listen, George, uh, on behalf of Chris Nelgrove, myself, Bill Courtright, Reputation Sensei, and the entire Digital Ma Media Nation team, we'd like to express sincere gratitude uh, for your generous uh, contribution here, the graciousness you spent with all the time. I mean, we we were all better for having uh, listened to or watched this episode. So from everyone here, thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. You bet. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you guys. Thanks, George. Thank you, everyone. That's all for this episode of the Sensei Playbook. May these strategies help you build a powerful business roadmap and dominate the online marketplace right now. Be sure not to miss another episode jam-packed with valuable advice from our marketing martial artists, Bill and Chris, by subscribing to the podcast at podcast.reputationsensei.com. Don't forget to share with your friends and fellow entrepreneurs who also aspire for massive business success. Thank you for listening. Until next time.